Well, we're going to turn together, please. We're, we're going to go to the Word of God this morning, first of all, and then we'll come around his table uh, later in the service. We want to read Psalm 15. Psalm 15, there's just uh, five verses in the psalm. Not right, John? John smiled at that. There's just five verses in the psalm, and we're going to read uh, the entire psalm together. The reason, the reason we're smiling at each other is because before the service, I told him, no, there's six verses. Just goes to show you I can be wrong an odd time, can't I? <laughs> well, there you are. Psalm 15. We're going to begin in verse 1. Praise God. Can I just say again this morning, it's good to have you with us. We realize it's such a, a bitter cold morning, and there's just been so much adverse weather, but it's good to be together in the Lord's house. So let's settle in, and let's gather around the word then. Psalm 15, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Just those verses, and we always uh, just commit the Lord's word to him, giving him thanks and praise uh, for his precious truth in our midst this morning. This psalm, can I say just as I begin, this psalm stands in, in sharp contrast, so to speak, uh, to the one just previous to it, the Psalm 14, if you still have your Bible open, Psalm 14 begins with the words in verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And then if you still look in verse, or chapter, Psalm chapter 14 and in verse 3, it says, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In Psalm 14, we have what you could call the polluted man, speaking there about his corruption, speaking about uh, the wickedness and the sin and so on that's in his life, the polluted man. And most commentators believe that Psalm 15 speaks of the perfect man. Two completely contrasting Psalms, the one that runs uh, immediately after the other in this portion of Scripture. Psalm 15, it's generally agreed, was written in connection with Psalm 24. Now, you might be saying, what on earth is Psalm 24 then about in that situation? But it was written, let me just say, we're not going to it this morning, but it was written to celebrate the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Now, if you're familiar with that story, you will know that David, King David, of course, was behind bringing the ark into the city. And whenever he brought it into the city, David placed it in a special tent or a special tabernacle. You can read about that, by the way, in 2 Samuel and in chapter 6. But the arrival of the ark in Jerusalem would vest the city with special significance. The Ark of the Covenant, of course, was the symbol of the presence of God. And now here's David, and in his administration, in his monarchy, he has managed to bring again the symbol of God's presence into the city of Jerusalem in amongst his people once again. And Psalm 15 here looks at what kind of conduct, if you like, should be expected of those people who had the presence of the Lord God dwelling in their midst. So this psalm is very, very significant with the presence of Almighty God. That's just a little by way of, of background to the psalm. But it's worth noting this. For centuries, the church has linked this psalm with Ascension Day. Now, you'll know what Ascension Day is all about. That was the the date in the calendar that's commemorated each year uh, in the Christian calendar where our Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, he had lived the perfect life, 
perfect in holiness, perfect in every way, and he ascended into the very presence of Almighty God. He ascended not just into God's presence, but he sat down on God's throne. He's seated today on the right hand of the throne of God. That's what the Bible tells us. And so as we spend a short time today thinking about these verses, there's a few things that that basically follow on from that. First of all, let me say that as God's people today, we should be a happy people. The Happiest People on Earth is a book that was written many years ago, written about the people of God. We should be the happiest people on earth. You see, the bringing up of the ark was a happy occasion. In 2 Samuel and in chapter 6 there, it describes for us that there were great crowds of people who had gathered to witness this great event. The ark, the symbol of God's presence, was coming once again into the city amongst his people. Large crowds lined the streets. They were eager to see. They were eager to to have the symbol of God's presence in their midst. There was rejoicing. In fact, it was a happy, joyous occasion in the life of the nation. And if you know the story, you will know that David danced before the Lord with all of his might. He was so overcome, so exuberant in his praise and in his worship and in what God had bestowed upon his life that he dances in that way exuberantly, dancing before the Lord with all of his might. There was an atmosphere of tremendous jubilation. They were a happy people in the city and in the nation. Because at last, praise God, the ark, the symbol of the presence of God, was right there in their midst. They were a happy people. Friends, that's what the presence of God does. It brings happiness. In his presence, the Bible says, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And the Bible says, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Are you happy today? Are you? (laughs) I should get you to shake hands with each other because that always makes the face a smile whenever you're up here. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. They were lost in praise. They were lost in, in adoration because the presence of God had come into their midst. Then a few centuries passed by and the same thing happened in Jerusalem once again. And this time, it wasn't just a symbol of the presence of God, but this time it was the true ark of God who was entering into Jerusalem. And again, crowds lined the streets. They threw palm tree branches. They threw their coats upon the road that that donkey could walk on. Jesus, praise God, was coming into the city and he rode down into Jerusalem. And again, there were shouts of joy. There were shouts of gladness. There were cries of hallelujah, hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There was joy. There was happiness amongst the people because the Lord was in the midst of them. And happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Are you happy today? Are you really happy today? You know, your face might not show it, but deep down inside, are you really happy today? Because you know something of the presence of the Lord. Oh, beloved, what rejoicing. What rejoicing there should be amongst those who belong to him. Those who have sensed and known and found his presence coming not just to dwell alongside, but praise God by his Spirit to come and dwell within the very life of the believer. What rejoicing, what rejoicing there should be amongst those who are the called according to his purpose. Because praise God, the Bible tells us that he hasn't dealt with us according to our sin. Isn't that right? What a truth. Let the truth of that touch your heart today. He hasn't dealt with us according to our sin. Neither has he rewarded us according to our iniquity. Thank God today, he hasn't cast us away. He hasn't condemned us for our unrighteousness. 
But today, praise God, we can say, He loved us and He gave Himself for us. Amen. Oh, friends, there should be joy in the house. There should be happiness in the heart because of what Jesus has done for us in spite of what we were. And today we can cry, redeemed, redeemed. The hymn writer penned it so well. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus has come to live in his temple. And with his love, my heart is aglow. I'm asking you again today, are you happy? Because you know his presence. What glorious truth. Are you redeemed today? Has Jesus set you free today? Does Jesus live within your heart and within your life? And let us rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. That's what the word of God exhorts us and encourages us to do. For Jesus has come and we know his presence. And you see, friends, that's what he does. I want you just to to take a trip with me for a moment or two. I want you to think about the joy and the happiness that his presence brings. Can you imagine Mary goes... She's told by the the angel that the Holy Ghost would come upon her. And she's told that she would bear the Son of God. And the Bible tells that she goes to visit Elizabeth. And as she brings news to Elizabeth that she was with child, it says that the child in her womb leapt. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what the presence of Jesus does. Let's move a few steps further along. And let's think for a moment or two about the difference his presence made at the marriage in Cana of Galilee. Whenever it looked as if their day was about to be ruined, the wine had run out. And whenever it looked as if there was going to be tremendous embarrassment, Jesus comes along. And he did that first great miracle that John highlights for us. And he brought joy and he brought happiness into that occasion. That's the difference that his presence brings. Think about the difference that his presence made in the house of Jairus. Jairus goes to see him. My daughter's unwell. And before he gets the length of Jairus' household, the word is sent to them. Don't trouble him anymore. Your daughter's dead. And he comes into the house and there's already weeping and there's already mourning over what has happened in that household. But think of the difference that Jesus' presence made whenever he took that child and he raised her back to life again. Oh, friends, there was joy. Amen. There had to be great happiness. There had to be tremendous jubilation in that house. What about the difference that his presence made at the tomb of Lazarus? Lord, if you had been here, Our brother would not have died. And he goes to the the tomb and he tells him to roll away the stone. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And praise God, Lazarus came forth, bound in grave clothes. What a difference his presence made on that occasion. And I'm sure there was tremendous triumph and joy and gladness because Jesus was there. Think of the difference his presence must have made whenever he appeared to his disciples there in the upper room. They have walked with him. They have lived with him for just over three years. They have listened to his teaching. They have seen the power that he demonstrated. They have witnessed the miracles that he has done. They have seen the lives of people whom he has touched and the tremendous difference that he was making in the community all around him. He went about, the Bible says, doing good. He healed all manner of diseases. Even the very demons were subject to his authority. What a difference he had made. But then they had seen him crucified. They had watched him die. And he was dead and he had been laid in the tomb. And they meet there in that upper room. Their world has fallen apart. Every single thing that they had placed their hope in seemed to be gone. Their entire lives had been given to him. Many of them had left their businesses, left their trade to follow this itinerant preacher who was indeed the Messiah, but now he's gone. They meet behind closed doors, they meet in fear in case they also might be arrested. 
Whenever Peter was confronted about his relationship with Jesus, he denied even knowing him. And the Bible tells on the day of the crucifixion that they, they were scattered abroad. They didn't even stay, some of them, to see what the outcome would be. And they beat behind closed doors in fear. And then all of a sudden, the Bible tells us, Jesus stood in the midst of them. Hallelujah. Oh, friends, what a difference. His presence must have made. There he was, just as he said he would. He was raised again to life. There he was standing right in their very midst. This one who has been crucified. This one who had died. This one who had been buried. Praise God, had been raised to life. He had the power that he claimed to have. Think of the difference that must have made in that room and in their experience. The Bible says, then were the disciples glad. I think glad's an understatement. But then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. You see, friends, today, praise God, His presence. His presence turns mourning into rejoicing. The Bible says He gives the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The hymn writer says He takes the gloom and He fills the life with glory. And praise God, the Bible says in Psalm 46, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Hallelujah. Make glad the city of God. The hymn writer says it's joy unspeakable and it's full of glory. And the half has never yet been told. Hallelujah. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Are you happy people today? Are you glad today? Because you know the Lord. Because those are just a few thoughts. Things that are worthy of praise. Because God's people should be a happy people. But next I believe, coming back to Psalm 15 for a moment or two. It tells us here also that God's people shouldn't just be a happy people. God's people should be a holy people. From verse 2 down to the end holiness of lifestyle is outlined before us in those verses. Look at what it says for a moment. In verse 2, it says that the Lord's people should be upright in their walk in verse 2. It says also in verse 2 that they should be truthful in their hearts. If you look at verse 3 for a moment, it says that they should be charitable to their neighbor. If you look at verse 4, it says that they should be careful of their company. And it says it should be, they should be faithful to their promise. It's outlining a lifestyle that God's people should be demonstrating, that God's people should be living. And then in verse 5, it says there that they should be merciful in their dealings. A holy lifestyle lived for God, serving the Lord, se separated and, and, and surrendered unto His will and the way He would have us to live. And these all speak of a life that's pleasing Unto the Lord, a life of holiness, a life that's lived in worship. And friends, a sermon could be preached on every single one of those points in those verses. And you're sitting there saying, Well, I'm glad he's not going into that today. But this is the kind of lifestyle that we are to have. Because linking the rest of these verses to verse 1, the psalm asks this question. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? There's something about abiding in his tabernacle. And there's something about this kind of lifestyle that ties the whole psalm together. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And then it goes on and it says, He that does these things, and we read verses 2 as we've covered, down to verse 5. The whole psalm is tied together with that thought. But friends, by the same token, if you don't live that kind of lifestyle, then it must also be true to say that you can't abide in the Lord's tabernacle or you can't be dwelling in the Lord's holy hill because these verses speak of a holy lifestyle. They speak of a lifestyle, holiness in all, all aspects of it, self-word, man-word, God-word. You check them out on your own, read through them till you see. There's holiness in character here. There's holiness in conduct here. There's holiness in conversation here in the verses of this psalm. 
And the question that each one of us has to ask ourselves today is simply this. How do our lives, how does my life measure up to this? This kind of holy lifestyle, this kind of standard. Because where we fall down or feel in respect of a holy lifestyle, we lose the deeper and the fuller sense of the presence of God. And so this psalm speaks to us of holiness. God's people should be a happy people. God's people should be a holy people. I'm going to leave that alone and we'll move on. But then finally, God's people should be a heavenly people. A heavenly people. You see, as I've already said, over the years, the church has linked this psalm to Ascension Day, to the Lord's ascending into heaven. And the church doing that, linking it to his ascension, the church is speaking about his homecoming into glory. His homecoming. That's where he is now. Bless his holy name. And see, here's the thing. That's where we soon shall be as well. Isn't that right? That's where we soon shall be. In fact, the Bible says positionally, that's where we already are. Because Ephesians says we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If we are saved today, oh yes, we may be walking here on this planet earth, but our citizenship, praise God, is in heaven. Amen. From whence we look for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be a heavenly people because we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. And you see, in this psalm, there's an invitation that's extended because the Lord invites, and I want you to follow this for just a moment. The Lord invites me. The Lord invites you. And he says, come. Look at this. He says, here's the secret of peace. Here's the secret of joy. Here's the secret of gladness. Here's the secret of blessing. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Just to abide, just to be in his presence. Where there is that fullness of joy. You know, friends, the word for tabernacle there is speaking of a tent. David had pitched that tent for the Ark of the Covenant on Mount Zion. A tent, and we know this, a tent is a symbol of something that's temporary. A tent is easily taken down. It's easily moved. It's a symbol of pilgrimage in the Old Testament. You'll look at the, at the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were all wealthy men, yet they were all tent dwellers. They lived with their herds and with their flocks, but they lived in tents, ready to move, ready to follow the call of God. Whenever David placed the ark of God in this tent or in this tabernacle, the law prevented David from even entering into its presence. Only the priest could have the privilege of doing that. And in his writing, the theologian Rotherham He rephrases the words of verse 1 of this psalm. He puts it like this. The psalm says here, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Rotherham writes this, Jehovah, who shall be a guest in thy tent? It's an invitation that's extended to you and me. What a wonderful way to think of God. He's the one who invites us in. Can I say this morning, if you're in this service and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, God, the Heavenly Father, invites you onto himself today. He invites you into his presence today. The Bible tells us that he gave his son because he loved us. Jesus died upon the cross at Calvary and in his dying breath he cried at his finish and God rent the veil in the temple from top to bottom inviting whosoever will to come into his presence to know this peace, to know this joy, to know this blessing, to know just a sense of his love. And the veil in the temple was rent in twain, as we've said before, from top to bottom, because it was God who did the ripping. Man had nothing to do with it. And the invitation is extended. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior, there's an invitation there extended to you. 
to come by the way of the cross, to come by the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ask for forgiveness of sins and come into the presence of God. He invites you in, right into his holy presence. David couldn't do that. Only the priest had the privilege of doing that. But today, on the other side of the cross of Calvary, we can know the very presence of God. But what a wonderful way to think of God. A God who invites. He invites his people closer to him. He invites his people, people into that deeper fellowship with him. You see, this psalm speaks of him as the host. He's the one who's running the party. Amen. And I say that reverently. And he invites us into his company. But only those of pure and holy and righteous character, this psalm says, can enter. Dear one, listen to me. If your lifestyle is of this nature... Then he invites you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we are invited into his presence. That's his invitation. And he's asking you and he's asking me to come closer and bless his holy name from the moment he saved you. He has been working on you so that you can come in deeper and deeper and deeper. But the tent is temporary. Let me read verse 1 to you again. Lord, who shall abide in my tabernacle. The tent is temporary. But then the verse goes on and the verse says, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now you see, if a tent is a symbol of something that's temporary, a hill is a symbol of something that's permanent. It's something that's not going to be moved. And in David's lifetime, King David wanted to build something much more permanent for God than a tent. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2, he said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. But today our Savior is seated on high. Today we abide, yes, in earthly tabernacles. But, oh, friends, praise God. There is coming a day, hallelujah, a day when he's coming to take us to be with himself for all of eternity. He's taken us out of something that's temporal and he's going to bring us into something that will be eternal. Something we will be with him throughout the ages of all of eternity. Here below, we are on a pilgrimage. Here we have no lasting roots, but we can have them, praise God, in his holy hill because he's taken us to be with himself. Amen. Amen. What a glorious truth today. And he calls us to look upward. He calls us to look onto himself. He calls us to fix our eyes heavenward because that's where our citizenship is. According to Hebrews chapter 13, our citizenship is in heaven. And today we look for him. Amen. In the days of time in which we live, we look for his glorious appearing. The appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will change our vile bodies that they might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work and whereby he is able to subdue even all things unto himself. But in the meantime, praise God, we can know his presence. We can know his presence. And in the meantime, we have his invitation to be his guest, to come in to his tent, to fellowship in his presence with him. And so, brothers and sisters today, we're going to come around this table in just a moment or two. Let's worship him today. Let's give him praise today. Let's be joyful because his presence is here by his Holy Spirit. He has promised to be with us. He is one of our number. Let the truth of that touch our hearts today. And let's be glad and rejoice in the presence of the Almighty. And let's worship him. True worship. I want to speak for just a moment something about worship. Why do we need to worship? Why should we praise? Why should we be extravagant? Why should we be exuberant as we worship the Lord? Why would David dance before the Lord with all of his might in spite of what others thought of him? Why would David do that? I want to make a suggestion to you this morning why David did that, why we should do that. I believe that worship 
We know it glorifies the Father. We know it glorifies God. But worship doesn't just do that. Worship, follow me here. Worship loosens us. Do you need loose today? Can I say this to you lovingly? I look down at some of you and you really do. You need loosened. You need to get into God's presence and get lost in Christ. Get caught up with Him, irrespective of what others are doing around you. Just get focused upon Him and get lost in His wonder and lost in His love and lost in His presence because true worship loosens us. Listen to me. It loosens us from the affairs of everyday living. And the affairs of everyday living pulls us down. The affairs of everyday living keeps us mediocre. The affairs of everyday living would put limits upon our lives. But he wants us to get lost in worship, that we might be set loose from those things and be captivated by the power and the glory and the majesty of the one who died upon the cross and saved us from our sin with the shedding of his own precious blood. You see, worship loosens us. Worship lifts us up into his presence. We say so often that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people Israel. But worship lifts us up out of the realm where we live and it lifts us higher, it lifts us closer into his presence. True worship loosens our roots here and plants our roots in God's holy hill. True true worship causes us to take our eyes, to take our attention, to take our mind off the tabernacle of our lives and how fickle and how weak it can be and how, how things can turn so quickly. Lift our eyes off those things and focus upon the permanence and the power of the Almighty God. True worship does that. You know, if you were a farmer today, you'd be able to agree with this statement. The wheat... The wheat dies downward as it ripens upward. You think about that. The wheat dies downward as it ripens up. As the grain ripens on the head, the stalk and the roots of the plant dies. Friends, that's what worship does. It ripens us. It looses us from the roots that we have found ourselves in. We are just like that wheat. We are passing rapidly from the earth, being ripened for our eternal home. And true worship withers our roots down here and establishes our foundation up there in his permanence and in his holy hill. And so praise God today. The veil in the temple has been ripped in twain. The host, he stands waiting. And the host says to every one of us today, would you come? Maybe you just need to come to Jesus today. Be cleansed of your sin. Be brought into right relationship with God. Or maybe today you're saved and you just need God to do something more. The invitation, the host says, come. Come into my presence. He's waiting, praise God, with arms outstretched. Has done all that he could possibly do. And his presence, ah, praise God, there's happiness. There's joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. And today he says, come. We come by way of the cross. We focus upon this table this morning. It points us to the cross. It points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way. It points us to the finished work, where in his great love he laid down everything so that we could be set free. And today he says, come. Be freer still. Come into my presence and know the roots of that which, is, that which is temporal in your life. Know those roots begin to die as you begin to get focused and established more fully in that which is going to be permanent for all of eternity. Do you love him today? Let's rejoice. Let's give him thanks. Let's give him praise for all that he has done. And the psalm closes with this little phrase. He says, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Friends, we are called to worship the Lord. We are called to give him thanks. It's part of the package. And listen to me, it's his due. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of glory. And he is worthy 
of our praises to